Parts Army. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. We're now three weeks into the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and at this point, I think we really need to talk about something that is wrecking our ability to see this war accurately. I'm talking, of course, about the dreaded fog of war. <coughs> oh, ah. War fog smells terrible. A lot of people are in a state of confusion about what's happening in the war right now. I really like the task and purpose has done really, really good fucking videos so far uh, on this. One of the very few, one of the, he's a grunt. So, I mean, he's like a, he's ex-military. He's an Iraq veteran. He saw, you know, he was active duty. He went in, toured in Iraq. Um, and originally I thought he was like, you know, I thought he was a boot, but he's actually, he's actually one of the few like Western, Western focused or Western centrist, uh, Western centric uh, content creators on the internet that has actually said let's pump the brakes here i think everyone is uh, currently celebrating ukraine's military victories but the situation seems a little bit more uh, confusing than uh than than you would suspect it's it's Thanks way to more echo nuanced. chambers created by our social media platforms and propaganda clearly coming from all of this in the u.s where i am it's very difficult to factor in reports of russian victories into my analysis this is because either no one wants to find that information or they're too afraid to share it, worried that they'll look pro-Russian. I wanna warn you, if you want some cheerleading video about how great the Russian army is or how great the Ukrainian army is, then this video is not for you. This is for people who wanna cut through the- f Yeah, okay, buddy, you talked about how the Russian convoy will reach Kyiv last week, how did that go? Did he say that? I thought he said they're building a forward operating base on the northwestern or the northern side of Kyiv in order to more effectively shell Kyiv, but their most, but their hyper focus right now is cutting off the fifty, uh, more than fifty percent of uh, of of the Ukrainian forces that are currently centered around Donbas to uh, basically shut them off from the rest of Ukraine, which is true. That is literally what's happening. He said that uh, his his prior analysis was that they're going to control the the southern and southeastern territories to try to starve out the rest of Ukraine or the, uh, to, to starve out the majority of Ukrainian forces that are currently centered in Donbass. I thought you said that Ukraine was going to get rolled, but that could be misremembering. No, I did not say Ukraine is going to get rolled. I said that Russian forces did not perform as expected on the first couple of nights. They also did not do shock and awe style campaign, a, a shock and awe style bombing campaign. I said that the Russian forces should have been able to effectively take out all of the Ukrainian, uh, all of the Ukrainian air force, and should not have had a single like Bayraktar flying or anything like that. They were not even able to take over every single airport, and that people were, and I said it time and time again, that people were way too positive about uh, Ukraine's chances here fog of war and understand the reality in Ukraine. Later in the video, we'll have an updated analysis of the 40 mile long convoy and we'll see if my initial assessment was correct or not. So to be fair, a major reason why it's difficult for us to clearly see through the fog of war, to accurately see the Russian army's victories, is because Putin himself has made it punishable by up to 15 years in jail to speak negatively about the war in Russia. The other reason we're mainly seeing pro- So you don't oppose Russia invading Ukraine? What? Where did you get that from? Like, where did you get this take from? Just a juicer, I think. Of course I oppose Russia invading Ukraine, you fucking idiot. What are you, stupid? I mean, the question answers itself, yes. The answer is yes, you are stupid if you think that. Pro-Ukrainian information about the war is because on March 4th, U.S. media companies decided to clamp down and shut down our access to Russian media outlets because they were deemed misinformation. Personally, I think we're smart enough to figure that out, to figure the truth out for ourselves, but maybe not. After all, I am the same guy that tried throwing a bucket of water on an electrical fire in Iraq. For instance, take a look at the Ukraine live conflict map that we've been using. It's important to note that this is populated entirely by pro-Ukrainian sources. That's what fills out all of the information in here. So even though this is accurate intelligence, 
the picture that we get inevitably is going to be skewed in one direction. I believe the consequence of this is that we might underestimate the Russian military. What I was able to do was dig deeper and look at some weird telegram channels where I was able to find the Russian perspective and evidence of some of their victories. That's right, I get put on all the FBI lists so you don't have to. In my research, I located evidence of Russian military successes that I think were- I'll be like, I'm obviously not pro-Russia. And some chatter will be like, aha, that's exactly what someone who's pro-Russia would say. Very cool. I'm following along. Very good. Tell me more about how you're not pro-Russia and how you think it's bad. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. That's exactly what someone who is pro-Russia would say over and over again. Missing from the legacy media's analysis of the war. In the south of Ukraine, here we see an entire Ukrainian base abandoned with all of the armored tanks and vehicles left near the city of Kherson. On March 15th, there was abandoned and destroyed Ukrainian tanks on the highway right outside of the city. But if you're anything like me and you get your news from TV and Twitter, this is probably shocking to you. We have reports of Russian special forces running patrols throughout this city, moving 500 kilometers north to the Chernyev region. There's footage from Russian drone strikes destroying Ukrainian artillery positions. These are all scenes that I think people in the United States, like me, never have access to in our closed off bubbles of social media. According to the Russian military, this Ukrainian armored tank column in Donbas region was destroyed by the Russian army using their grenade launchers on the tracks to disable them. I strongly believe that you deserve to hear the full story of what's happening on the ground. Don't trust me yet? Maybe this footage of me surfing the web looking pensively at articles on my computer will change your mind. Bro, okay, he's, I think he's literally making fun of Johnny Harris. He's making fun of Johnny Harris. Dude, this dude's awesome. This dude's funny as fuck. I mean, like, he's a little corn, he's not a little corn, he's just a huge cornball, but like, despite being a huge cornball, he's, I... No? How about me reading printed out pieces of paper? Surely now I'm a trustworthy news source. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. That, that shot's fired. That's actually fucking... Dude, dude, come on. Dude, come on. We will defend it. 13 Ukrainian border guards def Dude. <laughs> Why are you doing this? <laughs> Yo, look at that. Most of those troops crossed the border last week and are now inside the country. Russian military vehicles, including tanks, entering Ukraine. The invasion from all from Zelensky appeared on TV. Anyway, you get the picture. That's interesting. Okay. On March 4th, a civilian news broadcast from the airport near Hostomel shows that the Russian army has secured the airfield about 40 kilometers from the center of the city. Now, if we move 500 kilometers down to the south of the country, here we see how in the Donbass region, the Russians are handing over captured Ukrainian vehicles to pro-Russian forces to use. Look at all the Soviet flags flying on these vehicles. Can we stop pretending at this point that Putin isn't trying to put the old Soviet Union back together? Can we stop pretending that NATO... Okay, well, there you go. He's he, he still got some fucking ameroid tendencies. Expansion is bad. What if we didn't let Poland join NATO? Is it more likely that Russia would behave, or would they have just been looking to snatch that sweet, sweet land up? This morning, Russian sources released video footage of their artillery shelling operations near the capital. They also released a detailed map that they captured showing all of the Ukrainian army's defense locations surrounding the city. But I've chosen not to disclose that information. The point is the Russians have it. You take a quick look at the map from last week compared to this week. The Russian forces have made progress along every axis of advance. They haven't been pushed back or repelled really anywhere yet. To me, these advances are more compelling intelligence than someone telling me on TV that the Russians have low morale in their units. Of course there's low morale in the Russian units. Have you ever heard a soldier talk before? All we do is complain. I think it's too hot. You know what? It's too cold. When are we going home? Where are we sleeping? Sleeping in the back of the vehicle sucks. If you're in the military and your morale isn't terrible, then you're either not in the infantry or you're not deployed. Believe me, they had to keep us from attacking each other in Iraq, let alone the enemy. On Thursday, March 10th, cloud cover over Ukraine broke, and it gave the Maxar satellite images another look 
at the 40 mile long Russian army convoy just north of Kiev. Everyone was fixated on the fact that these vehicles had redeployed and moved under tree cover, and they completely missed the really valuable information here. Sometimes we can get more information by analyzing what we don't see. So these new images do not show us burning Russian vehicles. We do not see smoking, smoldering, destroyed Russian convoy. It's instead moved off the road into defensive positions under trees and into nearby towns. This tells us that the Ukrainian military either chose not to attack it, or they were unable to attack this big fat sitting dock. The media is already starting to admit that this isn't a stalled convoy. Just look here at where the blue line ends, that's where the convoy ends. You can clearly see that this supply convoy can't go any further without advancing past where the combat divisions are. US intelligence officials from the Pentagon and the Department of Defense say that this convoy is largely made up of non-combat supply trucks. They're carrying fuel, food, and ammo. Is it just me or is John Kirby over at the Pentagon one handsome devil? Some people see this 40 mile long convoy as a massive Ew. military blunder. Ew, and dude. in many ways, they're not wrong. With the fog of war, the situation is constantly changing and tomorrow, the whole convoy could get destroyed for all we know. The Russian army, in their attempt to quickly take Kiev, has failed to successfully secure large regions in their rear. This means it could be difficult for this convoy to advance to the divisions that are battling into Kiev safely. If the convoy went further south, they would be at risk of being attacked by the Ukrainian special forces in that area. We know the most elite Ukrainian units are operating just north of Kiev and have been working to attack supply lines, which has helped to slow down the Russian advance. The Ukrainian general of staff, whose reports have been largely accurate so far, if only a little bit biased, he had something to say about why the Russian convoy was pausing and taking defensive positions. He says the Russian engineer units are working to create a network of field pipelines in the territory that they currently occupy. The Russian military's plan, it appears to be, that they want to connect these pipes to a central oil pipeline in Belarus, where they can pump fuel to any of their tank divisions near Kiev. In the meantime, Ukrainian farmers now find themselves on the front lines of this battle. Military intelligence reported on March 14th that Russian forces are seizing farming machinery for these engineering projects so that they could help with this pipeline and help construct fortifications. In response, Ukraine farmers seem to be striking back by using their own tractor trailers to capture and tow Russian tanks away from them. This has now become a thing where Ukrainian tractors are pulling away tanks. There's dozens of these videos. I feel like there's a really great country music song opportunity here. In Ukraine, I've got two things that I love. My dear tractor trailer and my captured Russian T-72 main battle tank. It's got a V12 diesel powered engine. My girl, while well, she ain't too sweet on my Russian armored vehicle sitting on the farm, <laughs> well shucks. I tell her Vladimir Putin can Bro, come- Bro, he is so corny. Oh my God. Get her himself. No, I'm not giving away my Russian tank. It's got a souped up 780 horsepower engine. Yeehaw, can I get a hook? During the third week of the invasion, the Russian forces have taken an operational pause, which was something that the US military had to do in their invasion of Iraq. If we look at the east of Kiev, a Russian armored column last week made a push towards Brovary, which would put them in striking distance of the capital. If they can capture that- uh, Yo, is this a city slicker or what, dude? He can't even do a fucking reasonable uh, country accent. What the fuck is that? Actually surprising, dude. What the fuck? That town, they'll be one step closer to encircling the capital. They sent them to Iraq to fucking fight uh, with nuclear cornball energy, dude. They were, he was the real weapons of mass destruction. The Ukrainian military likely had this road zoned in as a kill zone weeks ahead of time. And I'll tell you why I think that in a second. So they'd set up a complex ambush waiting for the Russian army just to roll right in. We see the Ukrainians attack with artillery and possibly drone fire from the sky, maybe even tanks out of frame. The way this column reacts to contact is really terrible because they bunch up close to each other, blocking one another, making it very difficult to retreat. So we can see this column was attacked once they had pushed into the town out of all the farmland in the background there. This town then acts as a natural physical block, preventing the tanks from escaping the kill zone off to the side of the road. They're forced into this narrow zone of fire. This is a textbook procedure by the Ukrainian army for a successful ambush. 
It's been reported that the Russians lost a general in this attack, which is a really high up officer, and it destroys their command and control. It hasn't been confirmed yet though. Something interesting to note here is why are they doing this massive armored troop movement in broad daylight? It's likely because even the Russian armored vehicles lack sufficient night thermal imaging devices, and they believe that it's safer for them to travel in the day, which goes against everything that the US military doctrine follows. Moving in daylight makes them a huge target for Ukraine. Just the casual as a watermark? Dude, what do you mean? He's getting, he's compiling information from all sources. Of course, he's going to get fucking Azov uh, uh, information too. I get, uh, I, I look at fucking Azov videos as well. Ukrainian artillery strikes. Hopefully the US is sending night vision goggles and thermal optics to Ukrainian soldiers because this looks like a major weakness of the Russian army. Another mistake made here is that the Russians didn't follow basic combined operations doctrine, which requires good coordination and communication skills. Having air cover to counter the Ukrainian artillery would have been huge. They also didn't have artillery pieces set up to provide counter battery missions. Combined operations is kind of like rock, paper, scissors. You gotta have all the pieces or you're gonna get destroyed. Open source intelligence assets were able to intercept the Russian military's encrypted radio communication. Fuck Hasanabi Industries, Hassan Industries, the Bozo for copy striking other channels. Wait, what? Who? Communications from this attack. And when it's translated, they tell us something very interesting about the average Russian soldier's psychological state in the war that no one's really touched on yet. The translated conversation is as follows. Hello, Nitro. It's Udar. Listening to you. It's not what? true. Sixth Regiment. Can't report right now. Still gathering info. A lot of losses. They waited for us. Ambushed commander of the regiment is killed. Checking about the other. As soon as you get the information, gather everything, report to me, understood? They strike with artillery, tanks, UAV. As to my understanding, Barraktars. Checking on the other losses. This is the Russian soldiers reporting back to command. They're saying the channel Hasanabi Industries did that? No shot. That would be fucking, that, that would be awful. Uh, that would be a major mistake for Hasanabi Industries. You can't do that. You can't be like a clipper and fucking, and, and, you know, upload all my videos and then turn around and copy strike other people. Manned with the status of their failed advance. The fact that they're so certain in their communications, that it's a Barrektar drone that targeted them, is kind of fascinating to me. Because it appears like they never saw one of those drones with their own eyes. And if they did, especially because like, especially because like they think I'm doing it, people are going to think I'm doing it. And that's fucking insane. You don't strike. So they get the audacity to strike others. No, that's crazy. That's actually fucking crazy. You, you don't get to do that. I will fucking destroy you straight up. did see one, why weren't they able to attempt to shoot it down or target it? The Russian soldiers communicating here over the radio probably simply assumed it was a Bayraktar drone because there's been a lot of publicity around them. And they're a terrifying concept to the average soldier on the ground. Think about it. For your regular Russian soldier, the concept of being hit by some unseen drone is terrifying. It's similar to the psychological effect that improvised explosive devices had on me and other US troops in Iraq. Now, if we move slightly north of this location, there was another attack on this same column of Russian armor by Ukrainian armed forces. Here they use the British NLAW anti-tank missile system. It instantly explodes directly above the tank, knocking it out of commissions. This column's reaction to contact is completely different. They react in a much more organized and effective way by instantly identifying which side of the road the attack came from and returning fire in the correct direction. All of the tanks then got out of the kill zone, off the road, and they made themselves harder to hit, and they avoided any landmines that might have been placed in that kill zone. Most of the Russian infantry here, they made a big mistake though, by running away from the direction of the incoming fire. What they should have done is run directly to the closest cover, even if it meant the direction of the incoming fire. You never want to turn your back and run away from the incoming fire, because that makes you vulnerable. But on a whole, a much better performance by the Russian military here. 15 hours ago, today, on March 15th, 
there's been new ground attacks on the west side of Kiev. We can see over the past week, Russian forces have moved into this area because that's where the main supply route from the town of Lviv near Poland comes from. Once the Russians cut off this road, it will take an additional four hours to ship supplies in from the west using alternate routes that come into Kiev from the south. Looks like Google Maps has already started to reroute traffic away from that area where the Russians have moved into. So Lviv, where this supply route heads to, was recently attacked on March 10th with 30 Russian cruise missiles that hit a military base there. The city is 25 kilometers from the border with Poland. The attack killed at least 35 people. Russia claims it killed 180 foreign Thanks, Hassanabi, getting away with it for the tangy of the subs. Mercenaries that are stationed there. It's been kind of like a staging area and coordination location for all of the aid efforts from NATO. It's also been where US and British citizens, for instance, with the people who have volunteered to fight against Russia, they've all gone there to link up before heading into the combat zones in eastern Ukraine. Oh, this is what they were talking about, the, the area that got blown up for the foreign uh, soldiers. This attack appears to be a message to the US to tell them to stop sending supplies to Ukraine. Based on how the war has progressed in the last week, it appears like it'll take Russian forces another week to encircle the capital and another two weeks to assault. At this rate, unless something is done to stop them, we will likely see the fall of Kiev by the end of April. To the east in Kharkov, the second largest city in the country. Over the past few episodes, I've shown a lot of the Ukrainian armed forces perspective of what's happening there. According to the Russians, they've captured a portion of the Territorial Defense Unit and the 81st Air Mobile Brigade of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, which have withdrawn from the city at this point, according to them. Kharkiv is important because if it's captured, it'll open up the possibility for the Russian military to encircle all of the Ukrainian forces in the Donbass region. Another important development coming out of Kharkiv is that the Russian military has provided video evidence that they've set up successful refueling operations in the area. On March 10th, the Russian government officials admitted something that confirmed an early suspicion of mine. They are using untrained young conscripts in the war who likely do not want to be there and were forced against their will to fight in Ukraine. There are a few theories surrounding the use of conscripts. Some claim that they're purposely sent in first as cannon fodder. Even one Ukrainian who was interviewed said, quote, at first they seemed to be sending in people they weren't afraid of losing, but then there wasn't anything there. I just wanted to still, you know, just be safe. And I was hiding in a basement. The Russians who found us were serious, well equipped with torches and full communication, basically special forces. So it could be the case that the professionals wanted the conscripts to go in like guinea pigs to test the level of Ukrainian resistance. Another theory there is that they were accidentally sent in due to a miscommunication because there would be no real military advantage to sending in less trained troops first. Can you comment on, or do you have any insights on the recent developments regarding Russia's use of conscripted troops? Can you confirm? I can't tell if this was propaganda or not, but didn't Vladimir Putin say he was going to jail uh, one of the generals or something for sending in conscripts? Uh, against his wishes or something? Am I crazy? No, not the fucking FSB people for, uh, quote unquote, uh, working with, um, uh, working with the Ukrainians or whatever. Confirmed that they've recalled some of these forces and that their deployment to the front lines was seemingly the result of some kind of mistake. Well, I mean, we certainly have seen that. Um, that some of the initial uh, uh, battalion tactical groups that were sent into Ukraine in the early days uh, had conscripts in the force. Can John Kirby get an unironic hua from us? Sir, if you're watching this, I, I'm not even kidding. I, I love the way you answer questions. On March 9th, we got more evidence that contradicts Putin's claims that the invasion- That's some straight fucking- Yeah, that, that's- Oh, Jesus. Okay, well, you can't- Once a vet- Hard to shake that, I guess. Vision is going according to plan. This new evidence suggests that he's had a major initial miscalculation with the invasion, and he expected a swift victory in a few days because he reportedly placed the leader of the SFB, their own head of intelligence under house arrest, for giving him false information about the situation in Ukraine, which led to an initial stumble by the Russian army there. 
Analysts believe Putin has surrounded himself with bureaucrats who told him what he wanted to hear and not what he needed to hear. In this tense exchange with his inner circle, you can see Putin belittling his own team, telling them to speak plainly, demanding that they not mince words, which makes us suspect that maybe things aren't going well. Hopefully, that piece of information helps explain why I want to show you the truth about the war. I want to show you the Russian victories as well as the Ukrainian ones because without that, we'll be like Putin, making flawed decisions based on incorrect information. But there is a growing problem facing the Russians that they're going to have to start to account for. They've flattened these cities and killed much of the population that they're going to have to actually start to feed and give water to these people and help these people who are still left alive. The Russian Ministry of Defense has released footage of these soldiers handing out supplies to local populations. Footage like this is its kind of difficult for me to process because it reminds me of missions that I went on in Iraq where I would hand out food and water to the local population in towns that had been destroyed from years of war. I'm not saying that these conflicts are comparable, only pointing out that it kind of makes my stomach turn to see this kind of propaganda from the Russian media and at the same time know that I've been in similar operations firsthand myself. In Wait, no, he's... Wait, he's, you guys are misunderstanding, I think. No, he, it seems like he's just saying we did the same shit. In order to catch more of a glimpse behind the Iron Curtain, the Russian Ministry of Defense, they released this footage of the Su-25 fixed-wing fighter jet, which took damage from an incoming Ukrainian surface-to-air man-pad missile system, but it was still able to hobble back to base. This tells us that the war for the air superiority continues to wage over Ukraine, which is good news for the Ukrainian armed forces. How is providing humanitarian aid propaganda? It 1 million percent is propaganda when you're showing that to say like, look at us, we're good guys. We're not just like blowing up their fucking houses. We're actually providing them with food. And it's like, like, hey, look, we're, we're liberating these people. It's like, motherfucker, they wouldn't need you to give them food if you weren't blowing their shit up. There's plenty of evidence out there to support the claim that Russia is in way over their heads. For instance, the US Department of Defense says that Russia is asking China for military and financial aid for the Ukrainian war. Both China and Russia denied this on March 13th. At the same time, China's left the door open for sending aid by stating that China will not promise and cannot be made to not export arms to Russia. The fact that there's no reason to believe the 40 mile long convoy has started to distribute any of its supplies to the Russian division south of them is not a good sign for them. The rate of airplanes and tanks that we know have been destroyed is not good news for Russia. The fact that they've been unable to launch attacks larger than a regimental advance near Kiev suggests that they're uncoordinated between branches and they lack clear communication to headquarters. The point of this video was not to dampen our hope of the Ukrainian armed forces repelling the attack. I simply want to give a more balanced picture of the war, especially as we appear to be getting closer and closer to joining it. There is a massively popular video with 21 million views on YouTube by this well-spoken, very smart professor who lays out an incredibly convincing argument oh, shit. about why NATO is at fault for the entire situation in Ukraine. He makes the assumption in this argument that if NATO hadn't expanded, then Russia wouldn't have expanded either. I believe if NATO didn't expand east, then Russia would have taken over Latvia and the Baltic states already. And that's not what those people want. You might notice that for the record, the only way to talk about what Russia would or wouldn't do in the Baltic states is if you have to talk about the inception of NATO and how the USSR would have continued. You have to go all the way back. If you want to have a conversation about like Estonia, Latvia, whatever. But if you're going to have a conversation about Russia post USSR, like actually Russia and Hassan literally spreading pro NATO propaganda now. Cool. No, I'm not. But if you're talking about Georgia and Ukraine, then yes, uh, NATO expansion is uh, part of the reason. But he also very quickly hand waves how Putin's a dictator and says, well, democracy is terrible, too. It's easy to say democracy is terrible and no one should have the right to join NATO when you have freedom yourself. So this isn't a pro-Russia propaganda video. It's me saying that we need to know where the Russian military is having success in order to avoid being surprised by them. Because if we don't, then we will underestimate them 
and be less likely to understand how important it is that NATO continues to send fuel, ammo, and weapons. To me, it's a little bit disappointing that we've chosen to shut down those Russian sites so that we can't get insight into what they're thinking. I understand the argument, but it just seems like a step closer to war because when you go back and you start seeing when free speech starts to get pushed down, it's usually when freedom is less important and we all have to band together and act as a team. This is a delusional remake the USSR loony. Dude, how are you mood or blind? You've been here for 25 months, dude. Come the fuck on. First of all, if anything, it's Russian Empire shit. Like, you and I both know, you have to know that he's not a communist, right? You have to recognize that, right? Please tell me you don't think that that is. He stated it. So what? His sentiment about the USSR or Ukraine and Russia being a one nation together is, has nothing to do with his actual desires or his military capabilities. That is for the birds at home. That is to justify his actions to the people at home. America said they're going into Iraq to, to, to do Operation Iraqi Freedom. Does that mean that they actually were interested in doing that? Or do you personally comprehend that it's like beyond, uh, beyond that? And that that was how uh, they were selling that idea to you, an American. Putin doesn't have the capabilities of, of overtaking Ukraine in its entirety and maintaining troop presence in Ukraine for extended periods of time. It's just like you're literally breeding uh, uh, terrorism in your own borders then that you've expanded into. You've now become, once again, uh, bordered alongside NATO nations, and you've quite literally now, while you're simultaneously bordered with NATO nations, you have quite literally created a fucking hostile 44 million uh, nation that is going to constantly fucking blow your shit up. It is... Like the absolute fucking most idiotic fuck thing that he could do. What's his goal then? Keeping occupied territories? I mean, don't get me wrong. I think Putin would have an easier time taking over like the other Baltic states. Straight up. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. So those guys being terrified is, is a little bit more understandable. All jokes aside, nothing can bring down Moldova. I think he's planning for World War III and Ukraine will be his front. What? Team to fight a common enemy. That's when freedoms get sacrificed. So that scares me that maybe are we already at a point where we need to sacrifice our freedom of speech in order to band together to defeat a common enemy. What? What the fuck is this? I have your Sam hair type. We just can't pull that season four. What? I have your same hair type, and we just can't pull that season four Aaron Yeager shit, man. I wish we could. What the fuck do you mean? I think my hair is perfectly fine. But yeah, no, this was Ukraine fog of war. What's really happening by task and purpose? He just wants a pro-Russian government like U.S. did in 2014, replacing pro uh, Yanukovych with pro-American Poroshenko. Yes, he wants a pro-Russian government. That's what he wants. He wants Ukraine to turn into Belarus.